All right, um, go ahead and turn to Ephesians 2, 17. Um, 17 through 22 will be our main uh, scripture for the day. Um, Pastor Paul is out this weekend. He's, he was doing ministry in Georgia, uh, out there. And so he's, you can pray for him because he's trying to make it back, but there's a huge storm in Georgia. So his flights keep getting canceled. So pray for him that he makes it back quickly and safely from Georgia. But that's also why you see me up here. It's because Paul's not around. He can't get a plane. Um, this week, you know, Paul's been gone for a little bit this week, and, and everything leading up to this week has seemed like a hassle. Leading up to this weekend, things just kept going wrong, and we've, we, we just hit roadblock after roadblock, and even things with the system were going out, and this was happening on Friday, <laughs> a lot of it, and, and what was amazing is that even in all of that, seeing how we, need, we needed other people to step up and step in, so obviously you saw Rob up here leading worship, and, and I thank Rob for stepping in and taking that, really at the last minute, and doing an amazing job at that, of really leading us into the presence of the Lord, that's what I, that's what I love the most, is how much the presence filled us this morning. Um, we praying for Stephen. He is sick and has been in close contact with a family member who has COVID. And so we're waiting to see if he does have COVID. We'll pray for him and Lauren as well. Um, that, was, that was one thing that, that happened. But as, as, as everything was kind of falling apart and we were trying to figure out what was going on, I got this text message from Anthony Anderson. And some of you may remember Anthony Anderson. He, he used to attend here. He, he's in the Air Force and so he's, he's off in um, Louisiana right now. And he texts me every so often, just encouragement, or that he's praying for me. And he had texted me how he's praying for me, and the joy of the Lord is my strength, and, the, and how, how the Lord is going to carry me through everything. And so as I'm trying to juggle things and trying to figure out stuff and, trying to, and praying for the weekend and seeing all this stuff happen, I get this text, and Anthony didn't know what was going on, but he just sent that message. And so I responded to him. I said, thank you. I need it. <laughs> Keep praying. And I, I gave him a little bit more specifics, and he's going to continue praying. And then as we were trying to figure out worship, too, Rob, Rob was texting me, too, and, and encouraging me about the weekend. And, and, and the, the great thing was, was that, you know, I, I don't know if I really had time to think or time to worry about anything, but I wasn't worried about this weekend because of all the stuff going on, you know? But their words were just also just such an encouragement to me at a time that it, worry never had a chance to kind of creep in. And, and, and it came to me, and, and they strengthened me. They, they lifted me up. And it was two brothers talking to me, right? It was two brothers lifting me up, and, and we were just sharing about the joy of the Lord with one another. And so I bring that up because a lot of what we're going to talk about today is us as a family, and how we interact with each other as a family. And how God wants us to be a family. Before I jump in too much, let's read this passage. In Ephesians 2, verse 17, And he came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the spirit. What really strikes me is the last, the last section of that. And especially the part that says, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. And it's unavoidable that what Paul is telling the church in Ephesus and us today is that all of us together are being built up as one, as a family, as a house of God. And so we can see that, and, 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 and we, we sometimes understand it as we read it, but it's, it doesn't really happen in our lives and in and, and, and how we act, and for me especially, because I am very much one who 
is very much an individual. And, you know, within, within American society, too, the, the, the personality that's propped up or the ideal that's propped up is the rugged individualist, the, the, the guy or woman who does things on their own. But all throughout the Bible, we see that the Lord speaks to us in two ways. He speaks to us on a personal level, but he also speaks to us as a community, as his family, as his children, all together, corporately as a community. And in my life, I know that I can really put a lot of emphasis on, on being alone and, and spending time with the Lord alone. And, and it's good to do that because the Lord also did that. The Lord often went away into the wilderness to pray, to get the Father's input in his life, to get the Father's input on where, he is, where he's going, where he should be going. And so it's good to do that. And, and, and I, can, I can spend alone time with the Lord, and it's something that's grown in me. You know, years ago, if I would have thought, or I should just say years ago, it was hard for me to spend 10 minutes or 20 minutes reading the Bible and praying. But today I can spend hours just sitting with Jesus and just sitting in the presence of the Lord, reading the Bible, praying, listening to worship music, and just sitting with God. And we've been talking about presence a lot. This is the, the, the theme for, for preaching this, this early part of this year because Pastor Paul has four things that he's, he's talking to us about how, where, where he sees the vision of the church headed. The first one is presence, the presence of God. Second one is prayer. The third is transformation. And the fourth is evangelism. And so we'll start hitting each one of them, but we're focused right now on the presence of God. And what's been sticking out to me and what's been really been made clear to me is that the presence of God for sure is in our alone times and for sure is with us in our quiet times when we spend with God. But the presence of God is also with us in our corporate times as well. The presence of God is here with us right now. The presence of God is when you meet with other Christians for dinner. The presence of God is with you when you're just going out for a walk with other Christians. And for somebody like me, who often thinks I could be a monk pretty easily. I could go and just be by myself. I could go find a cave somewhere and, and be by myself, be alone, as long as I had good internet service, as long as, as, long as there's electricity in that cave, maybe not too far from a Walmart, you know, something, something real, real easy. And that my family was around, my, my wife and kids. I got to throw them in there. My wife will get offended if not. But, but I, I can feel like I, I can be alone with the Lord much easier and experience his presence much easier than I can with people. Part of that's my personality. Some of you may deal the same. Some of you may be the opposite. Some of you may really feel the Lord's presence around people, but struggle in your alone time. But the point is that we need to focus on our strengths and focus on our weaknesses too in that, in how we're spending time with the Lord. And for me, the Lord's really talking to me about us as family, People, spending time with people, being with each other. And when we spend time in the presence of God, we can't help but become more like God. And, and, and that's what the Lord is really wanting us to do. The Lord's wanting us to become like him, like Jesus, as he walked this earth. We'll never become sinless or, you know, so the aspects of God that, that Jesus was, but Jesus was also fully man. And so everything that he did and, and he showed us, he showed his disciples that he wanted his disciples to do what he was doing, the ministry, the prayer, the times with God and other people, and then the times alone. And what that really shows us is that we become who we worship, we become who we and who, who, who we spend time with, well, whatever we put in front of our eyes, whatever we spend most of the time listening to, whoever we're talking to, we start becoming like that, right? And we've all seen it in our own lives with friends. We, we've, we've kind of become, if we had a good friend, they dress a certain way, talk a certain way, even think a certain way, sometimes we would become like them or they would become like us and you just kind of start melding together. Spouses, I'm sure you've seen it as well, that the longer you're married, the more you become like the other person, or in the, other, the, the more that other people remark on you of, you're starting to talk like your husband, or you're starting to look like one another, maybe. And, <coughs> and 
And, and so, so it's that reality, it's that truth. And it was driven home to me earlier this week when I was at a buffet. We took our son to Peter Piper Buffet, and it was his birthday. So, you know, they have our arcade system there. And so my son was out playing. We invited some of his friends. They were out playing. Megan was with them. And so I do what you do at a buffet. I go eat. So I went up, got, got a plate, sat down, ate that. It wasn't the greatest pizza, but whatever. And then I got up again, got another plate, because I'm going to get my money's worth. Yeah. Came and sat down. And as I was sitting there, you know, everyone else was gone. I was just kind of sitting alone. And I just started looking around in the, uh, the restaurant. And I started noticing that a lot of us looked similar to one another. And especially in, in, in certain characteristics, <laughs> there, 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 was, there was something, something that was just so the same. And, and, and people were, you know, like there, there were Indians there, there were Hispanics there, there were white people there. And so there was a wide variety of people. And a good 99% of them had big bellies. A lot of the guys had ponytails for some reason. I don't know if what that has to, what that has to do with anything. I don't know, John, John Schultz, maybe you know. But I started seeing it, and, and you know, as I've been thinking through about what I'm going to preach on, I had known a week or so ago, and God's been pouring things into my head over and over, and, and this was one of the things he was pouring into me about, you know, us being, being like what we worship, and so... I was sitting there, and I noticed this in the buffet, you know, all this stuff, uh, how, how much I looked like everybody, and, and I was like, all right, God, I, I, I get the point. I don't know why you have to show it to me like this. I understood it with the other points that you were giving to me, so I don't know what else the Lord was telling me, but it, it was in that time, too, when it, it, it's just a reality. It's a reality of what we spend our time doing. We start looking like things. We start looking like whatever that hobby is, whoever we spend time with, we start looking like that person. And all throughout, the, <coughs> excuse me, all throughout the Bible, you have this line here that you are no longer strangers and aliens. The men and women of God in the Bible, if you look at Moses, Moses was somebody who knew God and God knew him. Moses was somebody who God knew by name, who spoke with him mouth to mouth and who allowed Moses to see his form. So there was a sense that Moses was a friend of God. And then also the disciples, when we think of the disciples, how much time they spent with the Lord Jesus. If it was 12 hours a day for three years, they would have spent over 13,000 hours with the Lord. And it still wasn't enough for them. They still ended up making mistakes afterwards. But that's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why we have the presence of God. Because even though the Lord left them in physical form, they're still able to spend time with the Lord in spirit. In presence. So as we read this, the first question I kind of want to point, point out to you and bring up is, are you a friend of God? Are you one who spends time with the Lord? And it doesn't have to be a whole lot at the beginning, but it's something that's going to grow the more you spend time with God. If it's only five minutes, that's fine. Just spend time with the Lord for five minutes. And then when the Holy Spirit comes and reminds you to spend five more minutes with the Lord. And then that's going to grow and grow and grow. But the Lord is calling us to be close to him and to be friends with him. And then even more, it says, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So even more than being a friend of God, we are also sons and daughters of God. This... This, this, this was kind of brightened to me yesterday when I was, it, it was in the, in the morning time and I was supposed to be working on the sermon, but instead of that, you know, I found other stuff to do because of procrastination. So I was kind of just wandering around the house and I, I thought, well, I'm going to just go into my daughter's room and see what she's doing and go hang out with her for a little bit. And so I went in there and we were playing, doing stuff, playing with her dollhouse, playing, she's, she's nine years old, um, she played doctor for a while, and, and then we started talking about other things, and one of the things we started talking about was, uh, was the Lord and was the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit is different than other things in the world, other spirits in the world. And it really opened up the door for me to talk to her about how beautiful Jesus is and how beautiful 
this life that Jesus has given to us, this salvation, this justification. You know, I didn't use those words, but I was able to talk to her about the beauty of God. And she was sitting there and just listening to me talk, and you could see her eyes were kind of welling up at times with tears. And it was a sweet moment. We, we talked for like 15, 20 minutes. And I would ask her, do you have any questions? And she's like, no. So I would kind of go on a little bit more. And I was able to just share about what Jesus did for us, just, just on a you know, father-daughter level, and just love on her and have God there with us in that moment. And it was really nice because at the end, too, I, I just told her, I said, you want to pray? And she said, yeah. So I said, well, you pray first, and then I'll pray. And she had the most beautiful prayer of just thanking the Lord for what he's done for her, for us as a family, for how he's loved us. And, you know, it was simple, but it was beautiful. And then I had a chance to pray after that. And it was a beautiful moment. It was one of those things that I'm going to remember, right? I'm going to think about. And it's, it's, it's so great to see how, how her understanding of the Lord and how her understanding of Jesus is, is forming and, and, where, and where it's taking her, even at her age. But then us, as part of God's household, you know, we, we're all like that. We're all like my daughter in that we're children of God. We're sons and daughters of God. And so in being in the household, we're constantly learning. We're constantly grasping the picture of how beautiful the Lord is. And we'll get an image today or a picture today, and that's going to be beautiful to us. And then tomorrow, we're going to get an even deeper image. And then the next day, an even deeper image. And there's a continual process of learning, of just being in the Lord's presence, of, of being in the family of God and responding to the Lord in those ways. So the second question is, are you, are you a son and daughter? Are you living like that? Do you see yourself like that? Do you see yourself as a son? Do you see yourself as a daughter who's not striving, but is just sitting with their father, asking questions and just gazing on his beauty? Beauty of the Lord, not me. And then the last part of this, this section too, says, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So the, Paul's using the imagery of, of, of a building being built. The cornerstone is Jesus himself. The cornerstone is is what everything else rests on. And then on top of that is the foundation, which is the apostles and prophets. And then the rest of the building is all of you. The rest of the building are the believers throughout the centuries, the believers to come as well, that are built, making up this, this temple of God, this building of God. I've been reading through through the Bible and, um, you know, New Year, all that kind of stuff you just start reading through. And I've been, I've been going through it pretty quickly. And I, I, made, I made it through Ezra a while back. And the, the beauty of Ezra, and especially as it relates to this, is that Ezra was going back. He had the favor of the Lord. This is when Israel had already been taken away from, from their land and in, into captivity. Um, first in Assyria and then in Babylon. And then other powers rose up. So at this time, um, um, Cyrus, king of Persia, was, had, had, had Israel enslaved. And, but Ezra had the favor of the Lord on him so that the king, Cyrus told Ezra, you can go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And so Ezra went back in, to, to Jerusalem and, and gathered people, gathered a team with him, gathered a family with them to rebuild this temple of God. And, and, and there, there, was so much, there was so much adversity coming their way in, in doing so. There, there, there were so many people against them, people in the area, people who, who had infilled there. When, when Israel was, was taken away, the, the countries that had taken Israel away had put their own people in the area to live. And so, so you had a bunch of um, foreigners within 
Jerusalem, who belonged to Babylon, who belonged to Assyria, and all these other nations lived there. And so all of their descendants were there. And so when Israel, as a nation, returned to rebuild the temple, they fought again with these same nations, basically. And, and it was, the adversity was so much that sometimes the, the, there wasn't enough of them, but as they were building, they would hold a, hold a sword in one hand to fight if, if they needed to as they were rebuilding the temple and as they were rebuilding the city. And eventually they get the second temple built. Now remember, the first temple was where the Lord dwelt. Solomon built that, and the Lord lived there among Israel. It wasn't necessarily what the Lord wanted, but the Lord did it. But what's interesting is that when they built the second temple, there's no mention of the Lord coming and living in that second temple. It wasn't the same as before due to Israel's disobedience. Israel sins. But what's also interesting is that the Lord had an idea that he, he, he was never interested in living in buildings, but he was interested in living in people. And so what that turned into is what Paul is talking about now, that the temple of God is being built up, and it's being built up with the family of God, the people who call on Jesus' name, who believe in Jesus, who are justified by Jesus, who have been saved and so this temple is this family. This whole building where we're standing on the shoulders of the apostles and prophets and we're all on, standing on, on top of Christ as well who's holding us up and all holding us together too. So my third question as, as, as we begin to wrap up here is are you a family of God? You know, we, we have our own family members, some of whom we like, some of whom, we, you know, may, maybe not so much. And, and we, we, we deal with them differently. But one thing that's true about family is that you're always close. No matter how much they annoy you, no matter their bad decisions, even, right? The, 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 there's often this pull to, to help, help them, to love them, to, to, to keep them close. But when it comes to church, there's often a, a quick response for people that we disagree with, people that we, we don't like what we see in them. There's, there's often a quick response to kind of push them away. When the reality is, we're all brothers and sisters. I mean, look around right now. Go ahead, look around, make eye contact with people. I know it's a little weird. I know it's a little awkward. Make some eye contact with somebody. Creep them out. But look around. This is your family as well. And, you know, we're called to, to love our neighbors, which is everybody who's, who's not a Christian, and we're called to be graceful and merciful and kind to them. But we're especially called to do so with our family, with people who believe in Jesus. And that also means without getting tied up around doctrine a lot of the times. You know, the Lord, what, what makes us a family is that everyone who believes in Jesus and who has hope and the Lord, who, has, who takes communion and lets the Lord wash them clean and knows that the Lord is coming back to redeem them and rescue them, those people are Christians, and those people are your brothers and sisters. doesn't matter what they believe politically. doesn't matter what other stuff they do. I mean, there's things with character. As you become a Christian, you're going to have fruits of the Spirit. And so correction is a part of being the family as well and saying, that, that's wrong. What you're doing, you need to kind of, you need to stop that. But we are a family that is often at odds with one another, and those odds often divide us. And it's easy to let it divide us, right? But here, Paul is really fighting for unity, and, and what he was fighting for there was um, Jewish and Gentile believers. We had talked about this before, um, how the early church, a lot of the Jewish believers in Christ thought that for it, they said, okay, uh, Gentiles can come in and, and worship Jesus as well, but they got to follow the Torah. They got to be circumcised. They got to do all these extra things for them because they got to be Jewish to follow Jesus. And Paul comes in and he says, no, they don't have to be Jewish to follow Jesus. All they have to do is believe in his name and call on his name. And so there was a big division going on. And that's why in here, Paul is saying you are no longer strangers and aliens. He's talking to the Gentiles. He's talking to all of you, most of you. I don't know how many Jewish people are here. 
But he's talking to, to Gentiles, saying that you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints. You don't have to go through all of that other stuff. And so that's the unity that Paul was fighting for then. And, and now we today have to fight for unity in the church, unity in the family, unity in the body, because so much other stuff divide us. COVID has been such a, such a divisive thing just in the nation, but especially in the church as well. We, you know, it's, it's been hard being a leader of a church in that time because people, no matter your decision, will disagree with you. Either you're not doing enough or you're doing too, too much. And you're just trying to do your best for everybody. And we've even had people leave the church based on their political beliefs, based on their beliefs about masks, based on their belief about science, vaccines, all this stuff. And so rather than fight it out with us and argue and, and be this body and be this family, it's, it's just easy to leave. And it's easy to say, no, I'm going to go, go, go do something else. And I, I remember with, with, with some of the people, you know, on staff, and it, it would be difficult because some of these people were people that we had, um, and others had really devoted a lot of time, spent a lot of time with this person, done a lot of ministry, been, been with them through hard times and good times, and, kind of, you know, and, and gave up of a day to go be with these people in crisis, and then to see how it changes at the end and how easy it is that for this relationship to be broken. So I don't say all of that to bring any sort of condemnation or anything, but what I do say in that is that we're a family and we need to start acting like a family. Amen. And not being so quick to let the relationship go. Not being so quick to just throw away our time together. Even if you disagree with us, it's fine. Go ahead, disagree. But let's talk about it. Let's be a family. Let's talk about it in love. And so my final question is here is, are you a family of God? Are you spending time in the presence of the Lord with other people? Um, one of the churches that I went to and, and was a part of and, and even did some teaching in too was a Southern Baptist church in Tyler, Texas when, when I was there with Youth of the Mission. It was called Life Point out in Tyler, Texas. And so I, I love the pastor there. He's, he was a younger guy. Um, I... Megan and I, well, I would help out with the youth. Megan and I led the young adults for a short while. Um, we, I also taught in the, their uh, Sunday school classes kind of thing. So I was, I was enmeshed in there. And I would also clean the church for them too at times. And, but what, one of the great things about that church is it was so much a family. They, they understood what it meant to be a family of God. P people took care of one another. People took care of us. When, we, when Megan and I were in Youth of the Mission, we had very little money. And people took care of us. People would even just take us out to eat just because. And it was such a treat for us. To, there, there wasn't many buffets back then. But people took care. People took care of us. And, and I, remember, I remember some of the sermons the, the pastor would preach because he, he, was, he was definitely focused on the church's family. And, and he, he had given this, this one teaching a few times about how he as a family, they, they would always make it to church. Even when he wasn't a pastor, they always made it to church. And he had this saying, we're the trammels. His name was Steve Trammell. Um, he's a missionary now. He says, we're the trammels and we go to church. And so he's telling all of us, you know, you, you just throw your name in there. So for us, it would have been, we're the drags wolves and we go to church. But, but it really resonated with me about how, how he made the time to go to church. In a time then, which is the same as the time now, when it's easy to, to kind of wake up a little later and say, oh, I'm too tired <laughs> It's easy to kind of throw church to the side. And so we started saying that too, except we didn't start saying we're the drags. We would just say we're the trammels and we go to church. It just made, made more sense there. And so even now, I, I still think about that at times when I start complaining or grumbling or thinking about there's something else I want to do other than going to church. And I say, no, we're the trammels and we go to church. <laughs> but but there's, there's reality to it. There's truth to that. We need to be in church so that we can be built up with one another, so that we're not so insular in our own ideas, in our own concepts, and in our own thinking, that we become isolated in mind and body. 
because we need other people to teach us and show us and, and reveal to us what the Lord is teaching them, which is going to often challenge us. It's going to challenge our thinking. And the point isn't to, as soon as you're challenged, say, no, I don't like that. I'm going to run over to this place that thinks just like me. The point is to dig into that and say, okay, Lord, what are you, what are you telling me? Is there something I need to change? See, oftentimes we try to change our environments rather than changing ourselves. And it needs to be the opposite. We need to focus on, on who we are and what we're thinking. And how do you do that if you're not spending time in the presence of the Lord with other people, with the family of God? Go ahead and stand up. Tomorrow is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Martin Luther King Jr. is somebody who I love. I love reading about. And he was somebody who was very prophetic in his time and even to the church. And there were, there were a lot of people in the church who didn't like him. A lot of people in the church who didn't even agree with him. A lot of people in the church who spoke against him. But he was, you know, he was, he was challenging the church. And, and, and we see, what, we see that how his prophetic voice, we see the fruit of that today, despite the fighting in the church. And, and he, 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 I've been reading through a lot of his stuff this week. And he would even call those people that, the, the clergy that, that disagreed with him, he would still call them his brothers and sisters. But he would say, you're wrong because this, this, and this. You know, he would, he would put his arguments out there. And so for some people, it was easy for them to dismiss Martin Luther King Jr. But for Martin Luther King Jr., he knew that he needed the church. He needed the family of God with him. And so he kept pressing in, and he kept arguing with them. He didn't just, just give in and say, oh, okay, you're right. I'm going to stop what I'm doing. He said, no, I think this is from the Lord, and this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. And so let that be said of us as a family of God, that we love one another. That we will love one another so deeply that offenses have no hold on us, have no division in us. That even doctrine has no division in us. All of these things that, that come from, from the world, that try to lie to us, that try to steal our identity, that try to tell us we're something that we're not. We need to get rid of all of that and look at the pure, pureness of this gospel, the pureness of Jesus who died on the cross for us and say, I believe in him. I believe in what his, his death on the cross has done for me. And if you believe that too, then you're my brother and you're my sister. And I'm gonna love you. So as we finish today, um, the altars will be open. Ministry team, come on down, step forward. If you need the family of God to come around you, if you need healing, if there's a situation in your life, or if you just need prayer, come down and spend time with the family. But I'm also gonna give you guys a task today. And then some ideas. But firstly, the task. Look around this room again. There's people here who you know well and people here that you don't know well. There's people here who you know their names and people here that, that you, you don't know their names. There's people here that you've seen every week as you come, but you've never spoken to them. I want you to find those people and just say hi. Introduce yourself. Introduce yourself as, as you being their brother, you being their sister. And just spend a little bit of time with them to get to know them. And in doing so, we, we're engaging in the presence of the Lord and we're building up the presence of the Lord in each one of us as well. So do so with that as, as the, the foundation, that as the heart. A couple other things you could do is that Greg Humbles, who is up here um, standing over there, he's going to be helping us reboot our greeters and ushers teams. So I know, I know myself, I'm very much an introvert. And so if you feel yourself as an introvert and it's hard for you to talk to people, joining the greeters and ushers teams is great because all you got to do is stand out there and say hi and all the extroverts will come up to you and start talking to you. So you don't have to do anything. 
So that's a great opportunity to get to know people. We also have dinner parties. Some have started up again. Some are, are going to start up here in February when we start a new semester. But those are times of just being around the table with family. Being in the presence of God with family together over a meal and just loving one another. So be intentional this today. Be intentional this week about spending time with each other and then seeing one another as family. Especially that person next to you who, who may be annoying to you. Who you may think, I don't know about this guy. But most likely, he's your brother. And so that's okay. He can be annoying, but you still got to love him. I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> was All right, so let's pray. I, I want to read this um, benediction at the end of Ephesians 6 because it's going to fit us so greatly. Paul says to the church, and we say to all of us here, peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with all those who love our Lord Jesus Christ with incorruptible love. So Lord, come and fill us with your presence anew as we stand together, as we talk together, as we commune with one another, Lord. Let your presence be the main thing. Let your presence be the thing that transforms us, the things that renews us, the things that brings us into a greater relationship with you as we get enter into greater relationships with our brothers and sisters. So Lord, we thank you for your message. We thank you for your words. We thank you for your truth that you have spoken here to us. And Lord, we pray that it fills our heart, that it fills our minds, and that it forms in us this incorruptible love that we have for you and for the family of God. So Lord, come and transform us. Come and deal with us. Get rid of all the other stuff, all the, all the fluff, all the things, all the lies, everything that's come on us that isn't of you. Get rid of it so that we can be pure, so that we can see your goodness, not only in our lives, but in the lives of our neighbors, in the lives of our sisters and our brothers standing next to us. So thank you, Lord, again for your presence. I know you're here. I know you're here, and I know you're moving in each one of us. So I thank you, Lord, for you, for your love, for your mercy, for your kindness, Lord. And help us to extend that to everyone else. Help us to extend your love and mercy and kindness to people that we interact with this day and forevermore. We love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, bless you guys. Um, we have people up here to pray. If there's women from the ministry team, please come up. There's only men up here now. Come up and get prayer. Have a great week, and we will see you next week.